had to hit the button. And I also need to live transcript enable. Okay, so now the transcription is also enabled. Um, this is the agenda, which I think you all joined after I or before I sent the last version of the link. Um, feel free to put your own name in there if you want to. Um, and I did not add the item legacy patch support. My suspicion is, and I don't have access to it either. <laughs> so oh, let me let me uh, uh, grant access. Oh, okay. This is Lucas's topic. Got it. Yes. Excellent. Okay, anyone with the link can comment. Probably I should make it anybody with the link can edit. The comment is fine. I, I and maybe maybe I should give you the screen to share, Lucas, so you can talk us through this. Okay. That would probably make even more sense. Um, let me know if I'll make you co-host just in case. Because I can never remember which of my Zoom credentials makes me do that. Um, so I have shared my screen. Is that yes? Visible? I see it. It's just, okay. It is to me, and I'm on a laptop, so I think we're good. So, um, in connection with my um, uh, engagement with Open SSF, um, you know, work. I'm not super engaged, but I do kind of um, follow and learn and contribute where I can. Um, I got interested in the in the issue of um, uh, uh, old um, <clears throat> dependencies um, uh, with vulnerabilities that don't get um, upgraded despite obvious uh, and easy upgrades. In this case, Maven mm -hmm. is showing that 35% of um, log4j um, uh, uh, downloads are of the version with the famous vulnerability. I see. So that hasn't changed at all. I guess um, this is through, yeah, this is pretty recent data. This is uh, three days ago yeah. or maybe today. Yeah, it's uh, actually I don't know the current date, but it's it's basically fresh. Mate. Which color is the good version? The green? Um, not. So I guess everything but the everything but red is good. Yeah. So um, so I got interested in that general problem as a systemic thing uh, in open source, uh, and um, and have been you know working on it in the way that open source people do stuff. And um, one of the things I've done is um, come up with a list of potential ameliorations, things that we can do differently. Uh, and you're welcome to follow this whole thing. I'll post the link. Yeah, put that in, put that link in the minutes, please. Okay. Uh, and I will. I'll do that. I could do that. Okay. So. Um, so I, 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 wrote, I did this writing and a, and a bunch of reading and have some other research going on to figure out why this issue exists. Uh, and I, um, I don't wanna do work to do fixes before I do research. And so it's a combination of understanding the realities and coming up with ideas. And um, one of the possible causes um, is in this topic of maturity levels. Um, a, uh, a more mature piece of software will be um, more hesitant to embrace any sort of upgrades. Um, there are often fewer developers. Uh, nobody wants to return to old code if there's a breaking change. There's risk and, um, and, and not that much reward. Um, and so um, older code tends to resist upgrades. Uh, and one of the biggest reasons um, that upgrades are a problem is uh, having non-breaking patches in older library versions. So um, developers who create a library generally want to be working on the newer versions. They don't want to be doing legacy support. It stinks for lots of reasons. It's not what they want to be doing. Um, and their motivations are somewhat contrary to the motivations of developers with mature applications who don't want to touch their old code, but who also don't want to 
the um, uh, 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 you know gathering vulnerabilities over time. So um, <clears throat> this creates a sort of risk. Uh, and the risk is that for a application developer who's considering um, incorporating a library into their um, software, um, they need to consider the risk that uh, at a future date when the older versions of the library that they're using are frozen in place, as far as they're concerned, there will be no patches, no security patches without a breaking change. Uh, and thus, um, I have um, proposed a metric for legacy patch support. I'll stop here okay. before I get into this. So I know we've we've talked about um, downstream dependencies and upstream dependencies. We've actually released a metric for, and I think in in this case, this is an example of a like legacy software. Would this mostly be downstream? So this would be some kind of package that's using a set of existing libraries and is um, locked in on older versions. Am I thinking about that right? Yes. Okay, and that's downstream, right, Bernard, Sophia? Yes. I always seek confirmation because I just, it's like um, verification and validation. I just can't but to keep them straight. That, that depends on the context. If I am using something, that means it's upstream that I'm dependent on. Yeah. And if somebody is using mine and I have stopped supporting it, then it's a downstream, so. Yeah. Uh, okay. So these are, this is really upstream then. Yeah. yeah. But so there's a, a vulnerability that's flowing from the library yeah. downstream to the application. All right. And then the, and then the issue is this application just is simply not, it's not updated. And so it's got vulnerabilities or issues in it. And the, there's an intrinsic, there's a lack of intrinsic motivation from volunteer developers to maintain this software because doing so would cause a lot of work for them without much reward. Um, is that, am I getting that right, Lucas? Yes. I mean, it just may be contrary to their motivations. Who can say what the motivations yeah. of volunteer developers are? They're complex. Yeah, well, I th so in, the, in a lot of open source, especially the corporatized world that some of us spend time in, I think that when there's an important piece of legacy software that a company needs, they invest developer time that, you know, so the com multiple companies will typically pay a developer or two to help maintain a project that's considered critical. And in the case of the legacy systems, there are no, I mean, I think that there's an implicit lack of corporate investment of labor here as well, if I'm listening correctly. Um, that is that is absolutely correct. All right. Sophia, I don't know if now is a good time to call on you, but I'm curious if and how your OSPO or to what do, to end, does your OSPO deal with issues like this at all? Or is this has this kind of issue been in your view? It may not be given where you work in the context, but I thought I'd ask. I'm trying to think what, what specifically, so we're talking specifically about vulnerabilities and sort of yeah. likelihood that legacy software includes dependencies that are not being maintained that could have vulnerabilities attached to them. Yeah. Um, so if I, use, yeah, if I'm using like log4j and it's a piece of software that I'm, it's not being maintained anymore. Ostensibly, there's there's also a premise that organizations, some organization or group of organizations, is still using the software. Um, I mean, I think we we have policies in place that make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah. Because we don't we don't want long tail liability that we you can't see. So when something right. like log4j happens, there's a disclosure and then the re remediation. Everything that's affected gets either isolated, turned off, or updated. So there was, it's addressed immediately. And if those systems are not compliant, they become deprecated. So mm -hmm. it's more like, not, I mean, 
I think there's always the possibility to inherit legacy issues in terms of acquisition, but there's this process in place to ensure that also doesn't happen. So I, I guess that it's really more of an issue for companies that don't have those sorts of processes yes. in place to ensure that what you currently have right now has none of these issues. So if something happens, it's a net new event that you have to go back and address. So to frame this as a risk, um, the issue is around um, adoption um, of a package, which may create um, you know, vulnerabilities that aren't patched in the future. So um, there, are, um, there are quite a few, well, not quite a few, but there are important NPM libraries that are very popular um, that are um, abandoned. Uh, and um, and that don't have any replacement um, without a breaking change. Um, and the um, overhead to replace code that has a breaking change in it um, is pretty significant. You really want to avoid it. So for the consumer of a library, the risk that they want to evaluate is how is this project doing as far as um, support for um, security problems in legacy version? So sort of the question of like future non-maintenance. Yeah. Right. I, I, say I, mean, this, I but, Yeah, I do see uh, that as a risk. Yeah. So in a, from a, context of use perspective, Lucas, what, what kind of, do you have specific examples of legacy software that you've encountered? I'm just, I'm trying to get my head around this concretely yeah. because I do think this is an expression of what organizations are generally trying to avoid by being aware of their risks and their dependencies. Um, let me, uh, I'm, I don't mean to put you on the spot, sorry. If I were prepared, I could easily find these. I recently did a bunch of work to identify and upgrade vulnerable upstream packages um, um, in Magma Core, which I work on. Um, okay. And, um, and I found that most things were approachable um, Except uh, when, um, except when they were abandoned, that was the biggest thing. And then there were some other places where the creators they just weren't motivated to patch old versions. Like they had moved on for good reasons. Um, and um, so I, I will, as a as a homework assignment, I'll come up with, with examples. But, um, but I, I can tell you that. Um, Give an example. We had a dependency on Storybook JS, which had a dependency on something that had a dependency on something um, that um, had been abandoned and had been adopted by a different project, but with major breaking changes. Um, okay. And so we were going to have to. I was managing this long dependency trail that was really untenable. Uh, and there was no good way around it. And the, the, um, th this actually has a, has a real impact on the entire open source ecosystem, right? Yeah. Like every, everybody's dependent on, on, um, on a lot of other stuff, especially if they're in the NPM ecosystem. Uh, and vulnerabilities in, a, in abandonware ripple through the fabric of open source as a whole. So if you're downstream three or four steps, it's... Um, it's a problem. That's significant. I swear it's real. So, Lucas, can I ask a question? So, what is the thing that you want to measure from? I understand there is a risk of not being maintained and being used. There is a one not being maintained. There can be or cannot be a vulnerability, but it is being used. There is a risk. But what we are trying to measure out of that. So if uh, uh, th that's what I'm trying to head around, like what we are trying to measure is like, is it not maintained or is it vulnerable 
or what? That's what I'm trying to understand from this legacy page support. It, it is um, the project's commitment to legacy security. And so some projects um, have a commitment to legacy support okay. uh, within reason and others really don't. Um, and for consumers who are um, hoping to create mature software eventually, um, it's actually, it's, it's very important. In fact, it's probably more important than current support because when their application is mature uh, is the time when they'll be most exposed to legacy version of their libraries. That makes sense to me. Um, I kind of am seeing this as sort of a specific case of our defect resolution time. Because we're looking at the, the case of there's no resolution time. <laughs> that things are just not being maintained. Mm. So it, it could right. be its own. I mean, I think the risk could be more specific in terms of like project abandonment and just like what to do if a project is entirely unresponsive. And then I, I, but I guess that measuring that is sort of like you're, if you're already there, you have a problem and you need to figure out if you're either going to try to fork the project and take it over, or are you going to try to rip it out and replace it with something else? And so I think we could measure that, but I, yeah. ideally you're measuring the thing that's leading up to that as in you can see when a project is becoming less and less maintained or less and less responded to as a way to, to flag it's at risk. This is something that we either need to get involved with now or figure out how to remove our dependency from. I, I, I agree with um, your basic insight. Like I think that um, abandoned stuff tends to be um, accumulating uh, uh, more and more unpatched, unfixed defects. Uh, and um, you, you'll see them in the issue list. I, I, yeah, I'm just trying to think of, um, from a metric perspective, this is an ex, this is sort of an explicit manifestation of the upstream dependency issue. And so what makes, a, I guess, what would Log4j, or is that an example of a piece of legacy software that was unfixed and lots of people depended on, or is that a more like the open SSL issues that we had a number of years ago. Um, Log4j is not, Log4j is a derivative um, problem caused by uh, other software. And so that the hypothesis I have here is that in mature software, um, uh, developers will be um, looking for a piece of text that explains this, doesn't really matter. Um, so developers who own mature software will tend to um, be less and less receptive to upgrades. Um, mm -hmm. be, because um, there are fewer and fewer upgrades that <coughs> are applicable to their needs. Right. So the, the hypothesis is that the, um, the mass of developers um, who are not upgrading their log for J are doing it because they basically don't upgrade older stuff. They, they upgrade when they implement a new a new library when they bring in a new library, but they don't upgrade old libraries. Okay. So in the case of like Sophia's organization, they would just stop using it. So obviously there are, there must be examples in the world of people who don't stop using it, but also don't invest in it. And so there is this inherent risk. And my question is, is this a, me is this a metric that's distinct from the upstream dependency metric that we have? Or is the phen I think if I'm listening correctly, that it sounds like the phenomena that you're describing is an expression of a specific case of out of date upstream software. So be a, there are upstream dependencies that 
haven't been addressed or haven't been fixed for lack of um, a clearer term. The, the distinction between um, this, um, <coughs> this situation and the general defect rate is that it is specific to legacy support. Um, right? So there may be a project that um, does an excellent job with defects in the current version, um, but um, stops fixing defects in older versions. Isn't that pretty typical of most software? Like you, there's only so many versions that you maintain and it's sort of a rolling breadth. Like I, I guess there may be so, cases where that's not, but I feel like that's pretty typical to only provide us a, a supported version of the last like five versus all of them. You, you are, you're, you're correct. There's, there's always going to be a rolling window, um, but some vendors have a bigger window and some, some have a smaller one. And, um, and, it, and it, it does vary. Well, so maybe that's what you're measuring. So oh, yeah. it's, it's more of a like, yeah. Because if, if you're focusing on the inherent risk of maintaining old stuff and the decreasing support over time of maintenance of legacy versions when there are newer versions of the tool, then Yeah, I guess that then that that's that is a distinct metric that we haven't measured in terms of how how far back do we go in terms of maintenance around software. And I think especially we were talking yes. about this for another another project that I was working on a project that I was working with where they were trying to measure downloads of old versions because the community doesn't know who's using the old versions and they want to know which elements of those versions they should still be maintaining or which ones they can deprecate support from. So they're tracking their downloads over time, which is, I mean, a, a tricky metric because downloads are super flaky depending on what you're looking at and get the CI CD rolling, but um, it still lets them know what's actively being used. And so for them as a, as a community, that's how they choose what to support or to continue to support over time. Um, and so I think that that's an example of how you would use that in practice. Um, so it's, I guess it's, we're looking at it from the perspective of the potential adopter versus the project. Cause I think those are two ways that you can look at it, but it's still, I now I, if that's what you're getting at, then that is a distinct thing to measure if I've understood it correctly. Yes, it, it is absolutely. So in the, in the algorithm I outlined here, I increment, I, um, I basically count unpatched advisories in earlier versions. So it's a, it's a little distinct. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, uh, what I think would be different now is you wouldn't count advisories in any uh, version. You would count um, uh, legacy versions that have any advisory. So any non-zero advisory count uh, in an earlier version um, would lead to a step. And so let's say there had been 10, 10 releases in the lifetime of package, uh, major releases, the max count would be nine. Uh, what is the advisory in this context? I think... Go ahead, Lucas. Uh, I think you're talking about security advisories, am I right? Yeah, yes. I was just thinking that too. Um, <coughs> I guess I, my one, I don't say my one issue because maybe I'll think of another one. What I'm struggling <laughs> with is that in the construct of vulnerability, if you keep coming back to log4j, so we the published the vulnerability, the first thing they did was release a patch that was a new version. So if patches are versions, then does that break this metric? Um, it depends whether it's a um, non-breaking upgrade, right? So it, it goes to December. But that's somewhat, that's that's going to be subjected to the project versus like, like as log4j, it was like what, 12 dot, one, sorry, 2.12 or 14, 15, 16, 17, like it was old version two dot. And so like by the end we were using version 17 versus version, what? I'm, <laughs> two? I'm blanking on it now. 
<laughs> it was only like Wait. five months ago, and I can't remember the numbers anymore. Um, probably two but it was just like Those weren't break to your point, not breaking upgrades, but like, can you make that distinction because it's still version two dot? Is that what you consider a non breaking upgrade, or is that convention held across software? Uh, yes, it is, it is widely held. So in that case, we should specify that because I think depending on how you're counting versions, if you're counting versions as the the smaller releases that are really patch releases, then yeah, the advisories yeah. will never go away because they're always on that older version. Um, that's right. So there were kind of like there's sort of three bumps we're talking about here. Let's say there is um, major version one which has a um, 1.0.0 that um, against which there is an advisory. And then there is a major version two, um, which has a release 2.0.0 um, and is the current release. Uh, and um, the advisory comes out and the project um, issues a 2.0.0. Uh, 0.1 or 2.1.0 um, that is a non-breaking upgrade to the current version, but they fail to release a you know 1.0.1 um, that patches it in the legacy. That's kind of the that's the that's the situation we're trying to capture. So the the question though, that like so I'm thinking of this from I'm hearing this from two perspectives. One perspective is I've got a piece of software and my if my piece of software is using an old version of a dependency, it should be updating that. Like that's part of what I do as an open source maintainer is I keep the dependencies up to date. Um, <clears throat> however, there are cases where like node the node ecosystem comes to mind where there's breaking changes introduced all the time and keeping things up to date would require a staff of 12 for anybody that deploys the node stack um that is correct in fact that's exactly what we're talking about here really no yeah. so we want to improve the overall security of the node ecosystem which is constantly getting locked up on this weird little edge case hmm. I mean, it's 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 really the culture of constant introduction of breaking changes around Node. Like in the Linux kernel, for example, it's simple. The reason I think one of the reasons Linux has been so successful overall is because you know you can update your operating system; and it's not going to break the stuff that already works. You trust that, yeah. and it's it's very similar with other core pieces of infrastructure, databases, messaging buses virtualization, you know, it's pretty rare that a breaking, you know, a change that can't smoothly be upgraded is it, like, that's just rare. Um, the place where I have seen it over and over again, though, is Node. And to and I don't want to, I'm not dissing Node, but I'm just saying, like, introducing these breaking changes when you've developed an ecosystem that people build their stuff on, that, that has a lot of downstream cost. Um, for you or upstream cost. Yeah. People who use your software will, are caught in a constant struggle to stay current. So, um, as a, so if I'm using software that uses a, a stack that's constantly introducing break, breaking changes, my approach has been to navigate, you know, to migrate away from that stack, um, specifically in the case of Node, because they constantly the library, the various libraries are constantly introducing breaking changes. Um, and if I'm, if I'm the producer of that software, am I responsible? I mean, I don't know. It's like, this is maybe just my, I don't know how this affects the metric, but it kind of my thinking as a maintainer is I, I, I just think it's bad software engineering practice to introduce a breaking change. If, if, the whole purpose of your software is to be used by other projects. Am I am I nuts? <laughs> Sophia, you're my sanity no. meter in this group. 
I mean, I think it's generally ill-advised, but <coughs> I mean, there are reasons to make major architectural changes later when your conditions change or how yeah. you're using it changes. Like we're considering converting something to a multi-tenant version of itself that is going to break a lot of things, but overall we'll get higher machine utilization. Like that, that is a breaking yeah. change that is overall more efficient. So we're going to do it, but I mean, that's a case of an individual deployment. I mean, I think the same kind of argument could be made for a piece of software. I think that um, this metric <coughs> can influence behavior. And that is ultimately the goal is to create a uh, package ecosystem that is more secure. Uh, and one thing it, this metric does is it encourages um, package creators to think twice about breaking changes. So uh, with that discussion, go ahead, Bernard. Yeah, so if you scroll a little bit up, I have revised the question because I want to frame a question so that I can at least think yeah. on those lines. Does it make sense? Am I looking at the, how many versions are being maintained to assess the riskiness? Yeah, I, I totally appreciate that. I think it's, that is a good change. It just expresses the point. The so thing that, I, go ahead, Bernard. Yeah, so if that is the case, then okay, okay. I have 10 versions. I want to assess how many of them are legacy versions, maintained, not maintained. It will help me to distinguish those. So because I, uh, from the implementation, I got this idea that we want to measure the versions being maintained or not maintained. I, I go ahead, Lucas. Um, yeah, uh, go ahead. Um, actually, while we're talking, I'm gonna I'm gonna look up an issue that I worked on uh, that has an example of how how much madness <laughs> we can get. <coughs> but so, why don't you go and I'll okay. Um, I mean, the question that keeps as as we talk through this. The thing that I would be, I mean, personally, the thing I'd be interested in knowing the measurement for, having a metric for is how frequently does a project or an ecosystem in, introduce breaking changes to the people who consume it? Um, you know, this happens occasionally with Python libraries that I use, but they're typically in the more, what's the word, the more um, breaking edge, leading edge kinds of software like machine learning libraries will periodically have breaking changes related to the way that they store models, for example. And that requires a little bit more work, but I also know that that software is evolving very quickly. It's not, it's not, um, I don't view that software as having a contract with me to always um, work exactly the same way with all the old versions of its models. And that's, that's okay. And it actually can change the way that I write my code um, for model generation. I'm but that leads, <laughs> that leads but, to me to think on two directions. One is frequency of updation of a legacy and how many. So whether we are focused on the how frequent, like more on a timeline duration side, that how frequently it gets updated, or we are on just understanding, okay, how many are uh, latest version being updated and how many are not being updated. So these are the yeah. two different directions. And, and there also um, is the issue of reasonable breaking changes. I mean, let's say you have 10, ma 10 major versions of your library. That's a lot and you yeah. can't support and you, you wanna be yep. encouraged to do that over the long term. Um, and at the same time, you know, to Sean's point about the stability of Unix, like POSIX has been incredibly valuable for developers. And anytime there's a, a breaking change in infrastructure, like the Python upgrade, I forget the exact the famous versions, but it's a it's a big problem to break. The, the 2.x, the 3.x version. Thank you. Uh, yeah, a, that was, <coughs> there were people unhappy. There's still people, I mean, they just de-supported 2.x recently. So um, maybe then there are two metrics in it. One is counting the versions, one is frequency of being updated. 
Um, so here's a real world example. Um, there was a thing called material table that influenced, okay, so I was working on Magma. Magma used a package called JSPDF. Downstream on um, JSPDF uses something called material table. And material table had been abandoned. Uh, yeah. And um, <clears throat> there were a lot of um, issues in the material table repo. Here's material table where you, so here's the last note from the actual maintainer before they disappeared. Um, and then um, over time, there were more and more defects. This was this is the literal like accumulation of defects and abandoned mm, software. Yeah. Talking about? Yeah. Um, and um, right, so here, here's a won't, won't fix in this and um, and everybody, you know, an enormous number of people are upstream from this one little thing or downstream from this one little thing and had this problem. Mm. And so finally mm. there was a community fork um, and, <coughs> and then uh, madly the community fork, uh, turned, here's a community fork, it, it had breaking changes right off the bat, major breaking changes and required a total rewrite of any code that used the original material table. Right, so for a mature piece of software, like this is a problem. Yep. Using yeah. that library in the first place was ill-advised. Well, it looks like the community fork only has one contributor as well. Um, right, then this situation is replicated across the NPM ecosystem, which influences an enormous amount of software. So that's why I'm thinking about yeah. these issues. It's a, I mean, I so, totally get it. Yeah. My, I totally get it. And my, I'm thinking like, uh, are we, so there are two things. One is atomic metric that what one thing that we are trying to measure. And one is like in the entire context, what are the different things that we can look into <coughs> the, which can be like, okay, how many folks that supports the maintainability, which is already defined how frequently it gets updated, different angles are yeah. here for this one. So which angle should we take and define or think that is more pressing at the moment? To me, the problem is more clearly expressed as um, uh, I don't know, it's like, maybe I guess, I'm just shaking my head around it. like how to express it and have it mean something to me as legacy patch support, because what I'm really hearing is you've got an ecosystem of software that has breaking changes and just stops working like even abandoned project here. Um, and the way I think that we've thought about it in this working group, like abandoned projects historically has been the one of the reasons that we use the other chaos metrics is to identify projects with a small number of maintainers, for example, so that we don't enable we don't allow them to be imported. So if I'm running a corporate infrastructure, and this is all things that we've learned, I think, in the last two or three years is I don't want my developers to just be able to throw any library in there. I would like some ability to be aware that libraries are being used and understand their health and sustainability when they're being used. So that if I have a single developer project that's being rolled into my infrastructure and I'm committing development resources to it, I might, I would, if I'm in charge, I would probably choose to stop that in an abstract I, case. <clears throat> I, I think um, there are there are a few people who are kind of super maintainers: Cinder Sorhas, uh, Jordan Harband, um, like maintain an enormous number of of uh, libraries under the node umbrella uh, but they're uh, not maintained yeah um J jordan is only in the node umbrella i'm not sure about cinder let me propose a follow-up conversation let's let's do this again next week after we've molded over yeah um, i think that's a good idea yep because it might yeah it's um it's a yeah that's a, it's a i think it does apply in this working group i think yep we totally need agree. to think 
But I also agree that we've kind of talked to death and maybe need to step back and get our heads around it again the next time we meet. Especially, um, I think that Vinod's perspective is kind of like that's the follow up. Like, how do we find a bright line? <coughs> All right, I'll make a note of that. If you want to, anonymous, if not, do you want to type your point in there at that last bullet point? Okay. In the meeting minutes, which looks like while I've been listening to the loop, there's a few other people that have joined, which is less visible to me. Um, Am I typing five? Yep. So um, I am trying to add my Google is not working. Somehow it's fifth time I'm reloading it. So is, I'll add this, I'll add my that. Uh, maybe just add it as a comment. Yep. It's just not typing anything. Even the even the minutes? <coughs> even in the minutes. Hmm. Do you see? I have written my name fifth time. It's not showing in the in there. So I, I've had this problem to... with Drive before with Google Docs. I, I just had to clear my cache, and that seems to fix it. And I, I've run into it once or twice. Okay. So clearing the cache just deletes so many things that I don't want to yeah. delete them at the time. Also. <laughs> Yeah, well, and um, I'm ho I'll just uh, point out we've got yeah. just a couple minutes left here, but I'm going to point out that we haven't yet had our repository review before updates from the you know the group that's going through and reviewing different repositories to see which of the published metrics that we have need to be updated, and with, so, so when we have that information, that's something that um, uh, we can discuss, but we need to table it for now. I think Vinya was reviewing the risk. Okay, it just isn't done yeah. yet. Which is, yeah, I mean, so, I'm not critical okay. about that. I just, I mean, I want to keep that in front of us as something that okay. we ought to do, but we don't have the data to do it yet. Um, uh, and I'll say thank you very much, everyone, for participating in the risk working group. Uh, good discussion about a new twist on an old problem, and um, it certainly made me. I mean, what I want is some little dashboard that's that like honks at me if I try to in, import a library that doesn't have a good maintenance infrastructure. <clears throat> I want the I want the safety honker to go off for me as a developer, so I know that I just I may be stepping in poo. Um, but that's probably not a productive way to work forward. So it does always make me think of another log four J example if you. We use Grimoire Labs. They were using open distro after Elasticsearch changed their license, and that was impacted by Log4j. And open distro had a public disclosure that was just like, we can't guarantee that anything will be maintained beyond this point. Please migrate to open search. Huh. Wow. That's <laughs> yeah. Helpful. So that was, that was a blog post because they, they did patch it. They did do the fix that was known, but they were basically like, nobody's maintaining this. Don't use it. Yeah, I mean that makes, so, and that's that's a case where they the open what is it open searches Elastic Elastic Search changed its licensing in that case. They did. No, this had... this is what happened after that change. So Elastic Search changed its license, and then there was immediately three or four forks that happened in the community. Um, Grimoire immediately changed to Open Distro because it was basically just packaging up the same components that were still under Apache 2, but older versions. So yeah. when the vulnerability came through, they patched that, but then we're like, this isn't being maintained upstream by Elastic anymore. So now it's now it's now they're moving over to the fork, uh, open search, because that does have a community of maintainers. Um, and it's continuing to diverge, but I mean, that's where things go when they're forks. So um, yeah. it was just an interesting case yeah. where I think if we do or measure it something like this, it's I think the concern I have is it's it's only going to, I mean, I guess it's only a moderate concern, but it's only going to spot the old stuff, like the really old stuff. It won't catch something like that where 
immediately it isn't obvious that this isn't being maintained anymore if you didn't see a blog post and a blog post is not something that is going to be collected in any sort of phrase metrics versus a year goes by and there's been zero activity okay now that's flagged like so it's, it's a there's a bit of a delayed where it won't really catch immediate exposure but ideally immediate exposure is going to be caught by known dependencies maybe a um an additional um algorithmic component uh, that allows for human inspection. Because sometimes these things are very obvious. Yeah. Like, like maintainers sometimes, you know, um, have psychotic episodes. <laughs> that, that, that happens. No. <laughs> it's driving crazy. I... It's, it's real. I mean, like uh, colors.js was a psychotic episode. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, I did let us go over time here a little bit, so I'll draw a conclusion to the meeting. Thank you so much, Lucas, for uh, tweaking our interest in this particular problem because it's obviously one that's out there and happens. So, a metric that would help us get to the bottom of it, I think, would be helpful in the end. And we need—I need to think about it some more to think about what that might look like, especially in the context of what we already built. So, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.